Hi everyone, my name is Khan. I'm a PhD student at IBM Research Zurich and ETH Zurich. And today I'm gonna talk about SMILE, set membership from ideal lattices with applications to ring signatures and confidential transactions. So this is joint work with Vadim Lubashevsky and Gregor Seiler. Okay, let's start with what the set membership proof is. It is pretty simple. So we have here, we have an interesting example. Suppose we have a set S, which consists of four socks, the green one, red one, blue one, and the yellow, uh, the orange one. And we want to prove that we have a sock which is in one of these colors without revealing which color it is. So let's say it's green. So formally, we basically just want to prove knowledge of an element, small s, which belongs to the big set s, which is public. And we want to prove knowledge of such, uh, such an element without revealing any information about which element it is. So the applications of the set membership proof can be, uh, can be as follows. Well, it can be easily transformed into a one out of many proof defined by Groth and Kolbeis. Um, so this is type of proof where uh, we want to prove that one of the elements of the set is a commitment to zero and it there is a straightforward uh, application to ring signatures because um, public keys especially in the lattice setting the public keys can be thought of as commitments to zero and then from ring signatures there are these applications to uh, confidential transactions as well as electronic voting so in terms of lattice-based ring signatures um, well, the best scheme up to date, uh, which follows that framework or this path from the previous slide, is the scheme by Eskin et al., which has uh, pretty nice uh, signature sizes. So even for large sizes like 2 to 21 users, it is below 150 kilobytes. Then um, more recently, at Asia Crypt 2020, we have the Falafel scheme, which uh, which proposes this new uh, logarithmic size or proof and the the size for 2 to 21 users is even less than 40 kilobytes so um so yeah so just want i just wanted to mention that asymptotically these two uh, schemes are logarithmic in size of the of the ring then we also have the raptor scheme which as you can see for even for 2 to the 12 users it's 5 megabytes which kind of suggests that it is it scales linearly in the number of users. And in this work, we propose a ring signature, lattice-based ring signature, which follows the, the path from the previous slide. And we, even for like big ring, uh, like two to 21, uh, we achieve 22, around 22 kilobytes. So what I wanted to mention is that this is really an active area of current research because there are in, in this conference at Crypto 2021, there are two more lattice-based ring signatures. So the first one um, proposes short signature sizes for, for small rings of size between four and 2000. Uh, at the time of recording, this, uh, this paper is not available on ePrint yet, but, uh, but the abstract suggests that, um, that the, the size scales linearly uh, in the number of users and then we also have the second um, the second construction of ring signature from plain LWE in the standard model so yeah just wanted to mention these two uh, other papers so in terms of our contributions I kind of explicitly uh, mentioned them so the core part or the technical contribution of this paper is definitely the this new lattice-based set membership proof, which can then uh, be turned easily into a logarithmic size ring signature. And then later on, we follow the, uh, the matrix framework defined by Eskin et al at CCS 2019. And we construct a Monero-like confidential transaction system. So in terms of the proof size, um, we reduce it by a factor of four to 10 times. But, um, but please look at the, the paper for more details about, uh, about the confidential transaction system, uh, because in this presentation, we will focus on this technical contribution, which is this new lattice-based membership proof. 
Okay, so let's start with uh, with our approach. So, um, so yeah, so let's go back to our interesting example. So suppose we have the green sock and we want to prove that it is it belongs to that set S. So what we do at the beginning is that well, we put all these um, all these elements of the set S into a matrix. So in this case, we have four columns, the matrix with four columns. And then we can define the index vector V. So in this here is uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, such that this matrix multiplied by this vector 0, 1, 0, 0 is equal to this green sock that we have. So yeah, so more formally, we have this matrix which, which each column corresponds to an element of the set times the index vector where um, it is one in the ith position. So suppose we have this element si and it is zero in all the other entries. And then we end up with this matrix times the index vector is equal to si. So for notational purposes, let this index vector be v and uh, we call this public matrix p. So equivalently, we basically write it as p times v equal to si. Right, so the naive solution can be thought of as follows. So this solution is, I am not saying that it's completely bad because it, it might be good for small uh, ring sizes, like 32, let's say. But uh, let's see, we will see this, it's, it, its disadvantages later on. Um, okay, so we first commit to V and the SI. And then we prove that PV is equal to SI. So this is this equation, uh, the previous equation, right? So um, as you can see, this equation, it is basically a simple linear relation, right? Because we commit to V, we commit to SI, and this is just a linear relation between the committed messages. So I will call it linear relation. But then we also have to prove that V is well-defined. So what does it mean? It means that we have to prove that it has the zero one entries and it has exactly one one. And we do it as follows. We prove that V has binary zero one coefficients, which can be what well, which which can be thought of as V times V minus one is equal to zero, where this multiplication is the component wise multiplication. And proving this equation is just a multiplicative relation on the committed messages, because V is committed again. And then to prove that V has exactly one one, we prove this simple linear relation, meaning, well, the matrix, which consists of one row of ones times V must be equal to one. And now to prove all these linear and multiplicative relations, we can apply this, the, I will call it the lanes framework. So the, the names, uh, well, so the, each letter corresponds to an author of, of paper, which contributes to the framework. With, and it starts by the paper by Atema et al. at Crypto 2020. So, they, uh, so this framework allows us to prove efficiently in terms of concrete sizes, uh, uh, proving linear and multiplicative relations. So, um, so what's wrong with this? Well, what's, well, what are the weaknesses of this approach? Well, we will need to commit to the whole vector V of length n. So if we consider big n, like, well, big size, uh, well, sets of, well, of length or size, let's say, um, 2 to the 20, then this uh, method does not really uh, work well in terms of efficiency. And, um, well, by applying the lanes framework, um, we end up with actually the big O of n proof size, basically linear proof size. And then, yeah, so as, as I said, if we, if we consider like big, um, big sets or later on like uh, ring signatures with two to the 20 users, then this approach basically would suck. So how to make it more efficient, let's say. So in order to achieve logarithmic size, we applied the, the trick which was used in many previous works starting from Groff at Kolbeis and Butto at Al. So suppose that n, which is the size of the set, is equal to L to the m. And then there is this observation 
that the vector v, this index vector v, which has exactly one one and the rest are zeros, can be uniquely tensor decomposed into smaller vectors, v1, v2, up to vm, where each vj is binary and has exactly one one. So each vj is of length l and there are m of them. So, um, so, so first of all, uh, this operation is not very well defined. So what we mean is that this is V1 tensor and then the, the, the bracket and then V2 tensor and then the bracket V3 tensor and the bracket and so on up to well at the end it's going to be V M minus 1 tensor VM. So let's just have quick examples. So if we have 0 0 1 0 then we can write it as 0 1 tensor 1 0. And a little bit more complicated example, if we have the vector 0, 0, 1, and then all zeros, basically 1 is in the third position, then we can decompose it as 1, 0, tensor, and then the brackets, 0, 1, tensor, 1, 0. So um, basically the observation is that ev every vector, every such vector v, every index vector which satisfies these conditions can be decomposed in this way. Okay, so the solution, the logarithmic size solution can be, can be described as follows. So we commit to V1 up to Vm, so we commit to these smaller decompositions, there are M of them, and then, well, as well as Si. And then instead of proving Pv is equal to Si, we have to prove that P of this tensor product of V1, V2 up to Vm is equal to Si. And this is definitely not a linear relation. Uh, next, we have to prove that each vj is well defined. So, well, which is basically similar as, as before. So, we have to prove that vj has binary 0, 1 coefficients, uh, which means vj times vj minus 1 is 0, which is just a multiplicative relation. And then we want to prove that vj has exactly 1, 1. And we do that by proving that, um, uh, what, well, that the matrix which consists of one row of ones times vj is equal to one. So as you can see, this, um, this solution is much better than the previous one because um, we only, well, we commit to the smaller vectors vj's and not to the whole v. And uh, well, hopefully I can convince you that it's more successful solution. But the last thing, but the one thing to describe is, well, how to actually prove this type of equation because it is not a linear equation. So, okay, so let's, let's have a look at the intuition. So in order to prove that type of equation, so P times, so the matrix times the tensor product equal to something, we will use the following two facts. So first of all, we need to prove that the inner product of PV well, I mean, there's nothing to prove, but I mean, this is a simple observation. Um, we want to, uh, so the first observation is that the inner product of PV and W for vectors V and W is equal to the, vec to, to the inner product of V and then P transpose W. So this is a very simple observation, but this is a key component of, uh, of proving linear relations in the in the framework, in the Lanes framework, and um, yeah, especially in this, this paper by Eskin et al. at Euro, at Asia Crypt 2020. And then um, the second fact is that if u, if we have the vectors u v, then uh, the inner product of this tensor product of u and v with w can be written as follows. So the first step is just the definition of this tensor product as u1 times v, then u2 times v, and then ul times v. This w, which has length uh, l squared in this particular example, can be written as, can be split into smaller vectors, w1, which has length l, w2, which has length l, up to wl, which has length l. Okay, so this first step is pretty clear. And then from this, from this step, to, well, yeah, from, to explain this equality, we have to notice that 
we use this observation or basically it's a simple fact that the inner product of u1 times v and w1 is u1 u1 is a constant just the number is u1 times the inner product of v and w1 so that's why we we can take u1 u2 up to ul on the one side and we end up with the inner product of u1 u2 up to ul and with the vector which which is equal to the inner product of v w1 then inner product of v and w2 and then the inner product of v and wl so uh so actually there is not much magic going on here it's just uh, just uh, a calculation and just um, moving around all these vectors and constants okay so if when we are in this step then uh well i can just write it as the u the vector u and then i can write this vector as the matrix vector product where well where, where the matrix is this matrix where the rows are v1 v2 up to vl oh sorry and then and this matrix is, is multiplied by the vector v so let me call this matrix w so at the, in the at the end we end up uh with um the inner product of u tensor v with w equal to inner product of u and this matrix w times v okay so we will use these two facts so um so the intuition is as follows for simplicity suppose that this um that the set s consists of vectors over zq so let's say these vectors have length k and in, in order to prove that to prove this equation so p times v1 v tensor v2 up to vm is equal to si we prove that for a random challenge vector picked by the verifier we prove that the inner product of p times the tensor product of these vi's vj's minus si with with gamma which will be the challenge vector is equal to zero okay so so how to prove that how to prove that this inner product is zero so first of all we well i don't know the first thing is to split this inner product so this inner product can be written as the inner product of p times the this tensor product with gamma minus the inner product of, of si and gamma and now using the the fact one um, we can take this matrix p to the other side by taking the transpose so in the end we end up with the inner product of the v1 tensor v2 up to vm with p transpose gamma minus the inner product of si and gamma so this is this part which comes from the previous equation and then in order to use the fact two we notice that okay this this vector here can be written as v1 tensor and then the, the the large vector which is v2 tensor v3 up to vm so we use the fact 2 here to to write this equation to, as uh, the inner product of v1 with w which which will we will discuss in a moment w times this second vector which is v2 tensor v3 tensor up to vm okay so what is w so the vector w here corresponds to this vector p transpose gamma and then in order to and then we just apply fact two so w is is a matrix uh, where the rows are w1 w2 up to wl and then we also need to take care of this second term which is the inner product of si and gamma okay i just moved the um the equations to the top so by applying these two facts the next thing to do is we commit to the x which is equal to w times this uh, tensor product v2 v3 up to vm so it is this is this term here and what we do is we prove the following two things so first of all we want to prove that x is well defined so x is equal to w times uh, v2 tensor v3 up to vm 
And then the second thing, which is kind of the thing we want to prove from the beginning is that we want to prove that the inner product is zero. So as you can see, this term here is indeed equal to this inner product that we want to prove that it is zero. Okay, so to prove the second part, we, we simply can apply the lanes framework because as you can see, V1, V1 is committed, X is committed, SI is committed, and th these types of equations are, um, this is kind of a linear slash multiplicative relation and it can be um, proven using the lanes framework. But now the first, the first part is more interesting because yeah, it is not a linear relation still, but it is kind of the, equ this equation, it is of the same form as the one we started with. But the main difference is that we have, we commit to X, right? We have the public matrix W and we have these tensor decompositions V2 up to VM, but there are only M minus one vectors here, which suggests that we can, to prove this relation, we can run run the same reasoning as before. So we have this recursive argument and then we can just run it recursively. And then at some point with M minus one recursions, we will end up with the situation where we commit to X. Um, and we want to prove that X is equal to some W, some different W times just VM. And this, this equation in the end will be a linear relation. And then we can apply this lanes framework. Uh, right, so, um, so one thing to mention is that in each step we commit to this X, right? And one might ask if uh, committing to one more X in every round or in every recursion step is um, costly. So as you can see in this step, uh, yeah, even in this first step, that matrix W has exactly L rows because each row is W1, well, each row, the first row is W1, W2 up to WL. So this implies that the, mate, the vector X will only have the length L, which will be small. L is this base, just to recall. So it doesn't really cost much, but yeah, we commit to every X in each, uh, in each step. So there are a few details which are um, kind of hidden because of the, for the presentation purposes. So first of all, if this equation doesn't hold, if P times V1 up to VM is not equal to SI, then the inner product that we wanted to prove is zero. And this inner product is zero with probability one over Q. So in our settings, we will work with uh, Q being around two to the 32 which is not very negligible. So this probability is not negligible, right? So we, 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 we work over the extension fields to, uh, to boost the soundness and achieve negligible soundness error. So this is one thing to mention, one comment. And the second thing, which is kind of the, the main drawback of our uh, construction, is that the verifier runtime is linear in the size of the set N. And this is clear just by uh, looking at the this intuition from in the previous slide is and when we want to compute this matrix W well in order to compute this matrix W we have to compute this vector right and in or, in order to com to compute this vector we have to the verifier will have to calculate P transpose times gamma and and P has uh, well P has exactly n columns so that's why the verifier runtime will be linear. And um, yeah, so, so if even though we have small signature sizes for like two to 21 users, the, the runtime might not be uh, that great. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for watching. This concludes my talk. And here is the link to the full version of the paper. Yeah, thanks.